everyone. This is a way more, uh, way more people than last year. I don't know, did anyone see my presentation last year at Laricon? I was like, one, two, three, okay. I would ask if you liked it, but I don't think I would like the answer. Okay, um, so let's get started. Um, today, I'm gonna talk about um, a topic that is actually related to what I was talking about last year. And um, the topic is less pain with gain and how Laravel is helping you scale your application even on the go without a lot of hassle. So, um, just a short introduction. Um, I'm working for About You. We are an e-commerce fashion player. Um, we started off in May 2014 and we've grown quite a bit since last year. We're 700 people now with 220 tech employees and we are a unicorn. So, um, short introduction of myself. I'm a software engineer. I've been developing software for like nine years now. Um, and I did, uh, have been working at About You since 2016. I uh, did my bachelor thesis in, on there for an uh, internal project. And since the mid of 2018, I'm a tech evangelist and tech events manager. And currently, I'm also doing my master thesis um, in practical computer science with a focus on machine learning. Oh, yeah, and I'm also a big Vue and Firebase enthusiast, and I'm currently addicted to Apex Legends. <clears throat> Any Apex Legends fans here? Okay, I say a few. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, last year, as I said, I talked about our BI framework cube. And um, I've come to realize just recently, um, Taylor tweeted about large-scale um, Laravel applications, and I just realized how actually incredibly big this project was. And the thing is that for the last three years, I have been working mostly with Laravel. Did a bit of Vue, and just this summer I started off with um, Firebase, or Node.js for that matter. <clears throat> but before that, I've mostly done C, C Sharp, Java, and now Firebase. And when I now started Firebase again, I've realized something that completely blew my mind. Um, with Laravel, working the last three years, I've actually never had to think about how my projects would scale. Because if you follow the basic architecture concepts of Laravel, um, Laravel actually does scale quite without a lot of pain. So even if at some point a big refactoring with other frameworks might feel like this, um, with Laravel it's more chilled out and feels more like this. <clears throat> and um, how do we get there? So I think you can't avoid refactoring at some point, but I will try to show some of the um, concepts that Laravel provides for us that might help you have a little bit less pain with your next refactoring or the next time your uh, project grows more than you expected. So one thing I think we should clear up first is what is a large-scale application? So everyone sometimes talks about large-scale applications, but how do you measure that? Is that lines of code, number of classes, number of rows, and there's many other measurements I guess you can think of for how big your uh, application is, but I'm not sure if that's the right question or the right measurement, because I think what really should be asked is, why are large-scale pro uh, pro uh, projects a problem? Because the machine can always read your code. It doesn't matter if there's 20,000 lines of code or 100,000 lines of code. Your computer can execute your code. So more or less performant, of course, but as long as there are no bugs, it will execute. And that's really the key insight here, right? Because more bugs occur if you have larger projects. So the main problem is not really how many lines of codes are there, how are they structured, how are they decoupled, and how can you organize your code in a way that it is human readable. So when you pass it on, or you get a coworker or something, they can work on new features without 
having to read 4,000 lines of code first and then knowing where the hell does this come from and then implementing something like a confirmation button or something. <clears throat> so the main goal should always be have the other developers in mind when you code something. And to start off, um, I want to start off with one of the core principles that Laravel is based on. Any guesses what that is? What's like one of the core architecture concepts of Laravel? Just throw it in there. No one? OK. Just going to tell you, it's service providers. I think everyone has heard about service providers. I'm not sure how much the um, service um, containers talk did go into the detail with server providers. But I think we all have heard of it. Um, and for those people that have been at my talk last year, I want to do a little exercise uh, because I like making people feel uncomfortable. And I would like all of you to stand up, please. All. <clears throat> okay, so the, so the basic concept of what we are doing now is I say something, and if you say yes or you agree with what I've just said, um, you keep standing. If you're not, you can sit down. Okay, I know what service providers are, do. So if you, no, wait. So if you know that, what they're doing, you can stay standing, otherwise sit down. Okay, cool. Good. Uh, I have extended the default service provider with extra functionality. I have registered an extra service provider, not the default ones. I've created a new one and registered it. I have modularized my project and used multiple service providers to bootstrap different modules. I fully comprehend how service, workers, uh, service providers work and use them everywhere. OK, everyone still standing can leave for the next 10 minutes. OK, so what is a service provider? I think we've saw, we saw almost everyone knows what a service provider is. Um, and just going to go through the basic um, flow of how a service provider is working and how the kernel is accessing them. So, so whenever, I think everyone has seen this lines of code. So whenever a request hits Laravel, um, it will bootstrap the app, and then the kernel will um, register all the, um, the service providers. And the service providers, sorry, oh, sorry, mm, that way, no, sorry, oops, is it up, no, to the right, there, now you see it, right, uh, there, sorry, Ah, apparently, sh key shortcuts don't work that good here. OK. Anyway, you've all seen this lines of code, and you can see that um, the so. the shortcut doesn't work for increasing Wait. Ah, live demos. Ah. That's why I don't do live coding. Okay, scale it up here. There we go.
Okay, now the rest doesn't work, I guess. No, it does. Okay, great. Okay, so we've all seen this at some point, and um, <coughs> the service providers are registered, and you have to um, define them in the config file of the app. So I guess most of us have also seen this, um, which is just the app config file. And um, when you would add another service provider, those are the normal service providers that Laravel is based on. And then you can also register additional service providers here. And this is the project that I've been talking about. And you can see here that we've been using quite a few services with different contexts and that you can add them here. So going back here. No. OK, so the main thing you should always remember about service providers is the register method is only for binding service containers, uh, is only for binding functionality to the service container. So that's most commonly used for singleton primitives, callbacks that would return a certain pro object um, that you can then eject, uh, inject into other um, components of your application. Um, I'm going to show that in a second. Um, and that's really good because you can, that way, you can um, separate the concerns for the different functionalities of your application, and it will actually increase the overall organization and overview of your application. So um, I'm just going to show here for a second how that would look. So ah, that's the right one already. So we've all seen this, I guess, for at least half of the people that are here. And um, yeah, you can, that's the normal app service provider. And you can add a bunch of things here. You can see here we are binding <coughs> a normal callback and a singleton, which is then accessible um, throughout the entire application. And you can just call that singleton from anywhere in the application. Um, you can also register other um, def uh, depending on which environment you're running on. And there's a whole bunch of stuff you can um, instantiate or uh, use as a singleton, including health checkers and so on. Um, what's actually, I think, more cool is that um, what we did here is that you can also extend other functionalities in the boot method. So um, I think most people use service providers only to um, register um, service containers, but you can also do a whole lot of other stuff. Like for example, here we are defining another view extension, which is able to pass SQL blade. Um, and you can also register queues here. So you can um, just get the queues, and then you can define all queues that are belonging to a certain service, in that case, the main app service. But you can also do that for other services that are indistinct, like uh, completely different from the main app service provider. And that way, again, you can all like have every functionality related to one service in that service provider for that um, certain um, app part for that module. Um, so next. <clears throat> And as I said, most of that should be done in the boot method, because if you do that in the register method, it might actually happen that you're trying to access a part of a service container that hasn't been registered yet. And that way, you get an exception, and the whole process will fail. Um, so I think that's already quite nice to see how you can like register and bootstrap different parts of your um, application in the different service providers. And um, also really cool is I think that you can actually look up like the, you, we just saw the view namespace, but can you, you can also um, 
bootstrap the comments for the special service providers. You can bootstrap a scheduler for the different and bootstrap providers and a whole lot of other stuff that I can't really, like, there's a lot. Um, so next time you're trying to like set up a certain service or module, think about that there should be a certain service provider which bootstraps all the stuff that is necessary um, for that module. So you can see um, why the separation of the different registrations for the modules makes sense and how it structures really well. Um, and it does help with the overview. But the question is, how do we communicate in such an environment where everything is loosely coupled and you have no real connection between the different services? Um, the answer is events. And um, for that, I would do another question. Um, and this time, if you agree with me, I would like to an answer you with a hua. Okay? I'm not sure if that's going to go really well. <clears throat> okay, so I'd ask the question, then I count to three, and if you agree or if, you've, if that is positive for you, you, can, uh, you have to answer with a hua. Okay, so who here is using events in their application? One, two, three. Okay, that was like not a lot. Let's try that again. One, two, three. Okay, getting more. So, <clears throat> so Laravel events is another really powerful way to decouple your application parts and then have them communicate that way. Um, and to show that off, I'm just going to show you really quick how a basic event class will look like and how you would register that. Uh, so, <clears throat> so a basic event has a construct has a construct method and then also usually a handle method. Wait, I wanted to show another way. Uh, let's go to this one. Okay, so a normal event has a constructor method and a handle method. The constructor method just basically takes in the event and then handles whatever is coming in. Um, it's really straightforward and really easy, I think, to use. And um, you can simply fire that by um, going to the event facade and then say fire, and then it will go off and send it into the, the, to the rest of the application. Um, but how do you um, listen for those? So one way is to register an event here. Um, you have the event service provider that is usually there out of the box for Laravel. And you can um, define certain events that you can see here. And you can either have then one handler that answers or takes in that event and handles it. Or you can have multiple event handlers here. Um, What's also possible, uh, wait. So, what's also possible is you can create manual event handlers. So, if you don't want to have a separate event handler service, you can basically just uh, access the event facade and then say, listen, define a certain name for event, and then create a call or um, use a callback to handle that event. And that is also possible with wildcards. So you can include a in wildcard and it will trigger that category or it will trigger that category of event. And also, just recently with uh, Laravel 5.89, um, we've gotten event discovery. I've not used that yet. And I think it's kind of scary that it will just more do ma more magic with Laravel. But basically what it does, it's looking for um, functions that take in events and then will automatically um, um, put the events that are coming in into that event and handle, uh, make them handle them. So that's also really nice if you can decouple the functionality and still communicate via events. So the last thing I want to talk to you about is something that I think is not as relevant for decoupling. It also does that, but it's more relevant um, to think about when you start your application 
and at some point it might grow. So what is really, I think, essential is to avoid unnecessary computation. So whenever you have a request coming in, you don't want to waste a few milliseconds on sending out an email, compressing a picture, or some other computation that just takes time but could have done later. And the main, um, and the, of course, the solution to that would be queues. And um, last question round, I promise. Um, who here is using queues in their application? Just raise your hands, no extra effort. Okay, that's most of them. Um, who's using um, Amazon SQS with that? Okay, thought it would be more. Redis, mostly, I guess. Yeah, okay. And then rela relational databases. Ah, okay, more than I thought. Okay, so um, the good thing is Laravel provides us with an interface to just easily use all of those, and you don't actually have to worry about them. So that's the nice part of, about that. And uh, I'm just gonna quickly go over that because I think most of you have already used the um, queues, um, but some of the key features I think are really cool is that, um, as you saw, you can also register them in the service provider. Here. And um, you can actually do that automatically, so you don't have to, um, like usually you would do that in the config file, but you can also do that within the service provider, and that way actually can um, dynamically input certain values into that, which is, I think, really cool because that really was a pain for us when we were implementing this, and it saved us a lot of time in the end being able to define different queues on the go. And what you can see here is that you can not just determine like the name of the queue and the description, but you can also um, like define the, how many workers should be on there, so you can def basically prioritize how many um, work should be going to that. And you can also define stuff like the max retries, how long the whole thing should be blocked, and other things. Um, I think there is a talk on that tomorrow, and I think that's going to be really cool. So yeah, use queues for um, even if you might not think it's valuable yet. Um, but I think um, if you ever get there and your project scales, it's not that much more effort to do it, and it really helps um, when scaling your application. Okay, so those were the queuing parameters. And um, how that basically works, I'm just gonna quickly just go over it in, in detail, uh, in short, on a high level. Um, so basically, how that happens is you create a job class, and um, that job is then dispatched, and you can easily say, I want to dispatch the uh, job to a certain queue or a default queue. If you don't define that, you can also define a certain delay on how long the job should be, be waiting for until it's dispatched to that certain queue. And um, yeah, so um, queues, you could talk about queues for like one hour, but um, I think you get a basic overview of why it's good for decoupling and how it can save you a lot of time when you're actually growing your application. <clears throat> so, um, summon, uh, like summoning up, um, in general advice, um, if you want to make your application scalable, um, and it's in general a good practice to use service providers if you create new functionality in your application, um, you should always try to do that. The same with events and queues. Uh, there's also some other practices which I couldn't mention out of time reasons. Um, but um, if you don't get the point yet, if I couldn't deliver it, maybe you should just go for another framework and try that out and then come back and thank Taylor and the rest of the Laravel team for building Laravel because I think it's really fucking amazing. And I just learned how much time it saves me when building large-scale applications. Um, because I don't really have to worry about it because it's just all there for me when I'm uh, implementing something. Thank you.